Good afternoon, and welcome back to Racism and its Implications in Clinical Research, a workshop to promote understanding and action. For those who are just joining, welcome. For housekeeping purposes during this webinar, if you have a question for our presenter, we kindly ask you use the Q&A box to submit your question. It will be best seen this way. Also, in the chat, you will see a link to access today's program for your reference. At this time, I would like to introduce another planning commi committee member of this workshop, Dr. Jennifer Lingler. Dr. Lingler is professor and vice chair of research in the Department of Health and Community Systems at the University of Pittsburgh School of Nursing. She is also faculty at Pitt Center for Bioethics and Health Law and NIH funded Alzheimer's Disease Research Center where she leads the Outreach, Recruitment and Engagement Corps and co-leads the research education component. Dr. Lingler's scholarship takes an empirical approach to research ethics. Her studies have focused on the responsible return of high stakes research test results to participants, as well as the development and testing of strategies to promote diversity in Alzheimer's research. She is a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing and has received numerous awards in recognition of her research contributions. And it's my pleasure to give the floor to you, Dr. Lingler. Thank you, Melita. And welcome back, everyone. And welcome to those who are joining us for the first time this afternoon. It is my distinct honor to introduce our featured speaker for session two, Dr. Jonathan Jackson. Dr. Jackson is the Executive Director of the Community Access Recruitment and Engagement or CARE Research Center at Massachusetts General Hospital and is an Assistant Professor of Neurology at Harvard Medical School. CARE investigates the impact of diversity and inclusion on the quality of human subjects research and leverages deep community entrenchment to build trust and overcome barriers to clinical trial participation. Dr. Jackson's research focuses on inequities in clinical settings that affect underserved populations, and he's received generous funding from this work from the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research, Massachusetts General Hospital, and the National Institutes of Health, including a prestigious NIH Pioneer Award to advance the this work. Dr. Jackson holds a doctoral degree in psych psychological and brain sciences, which he earned in 2014, and conducts a line of research as a cognitive neuroscientist investigating the early detection of Alzheimer's disease, particularly in the absence of overt memory problems. He's become well-known representative to underserved communities and dozens of affiliated organizations, especially regarding participation in clinical trial research. Dr. Jackson serves in an um, advisory capacity to several organizations focused on equity and clinical research and has written guidance for local, statewide, and national groups on research access, engagement, and participation. I first was introduced to Dr. Jackson at a um, workshop in 2018 on promoting African American enrollment in Alzheimer's research that was offered at the Washington University in St. Louis, and have been trying to think of a way to get him to Pittsburgh ever since that time. So it is a true honor that the day has come, and it is my pleasure to turn the virtual microphone over to Dr. Jackson. Welcome to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it has been a while since I was actually in uh, Pittsburgh physically, but uh, I, I've been a few times and I've loved every single visit that I've ever had. So I, I wish I could be there among you all today, but uh, thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Dr. Lingler. And Melita, thank you for, for calling this meeting to order. So I am uh, going to share my screen and uh, hopefully we don't have too many difficulties with it. Uh, I think we've all had more than enough time to get used to Zoom. So here's hoping that this works well. Um, so uh, I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, how hard it is to think about equity in, in clinical research, but also how crucial it is uh, and how much that uh, the problem of equity, the problem of research diversity and inclusion and representation is really tied to basic problems of, uh, of research integrity, of good research practice. Uh, and so hopefully I connect all of these dots for you. Uh, and by the end of this talk, uh, we'll, we'll all be speaking the same language. Um, so there are really only three things that I wanna get through in the next half hour or so. First, I wanna talk to you about the history of what I'm currently calling representation science. You can think of it in terms of uh, uh, diversity science or uh, recruitment science. 
Um, but I think representation is probably the best term for this. Um, then uh, point two is actually a single slide where we're going to talk about what is meant by disparities. And I think it's a really great foregrounding for uh, part three, where we're going to talk about why we need to think about biases and selection measurement and implementation in order to address the problems uh, of health equity. Uh, so I wanted to very briefly mention my disclosures. Uh, so Dr. Lingler uh, talked about where my funding comes from for my research. I wanted to just kind of direct it to the second major bullet point uh, where uh, our community engagement work, uh, so the Care Research Center isn't just a research center. Uh, we do a lot of community events in Greater Boston, and uh, those activities are supported uh, by the Amgen Foundation, Otsuka Pharmaceutical, and Us Against Alzheimer's. Uh, I want to quickly note that uh, none of these dollars uh, ever go to any sort of research projects or uh, any salaries of anybody at the Care Research Center. It all goes right back into the community. Uh, so let's go ahead and start with the, you know, this initial discussion of the history of representation science. So for those of us who have uh, learned about neuroscience or uh, were trained in neurology, uh, when you learn about the history of that, you usually start with the icky topic of phrenology. Uh, you know, this idea of looking for lumps in people's heads uh, that, that connects them to, to different sorts of uh, moral in, aspects of moral integrity or intelligence. Uh, so obviously phrenology, phrenology has been widely debunked. Uh, but when it comes to talking about representation science, we're actually still doing a lot of the things uh, that are connected uh, to an unethical historical context. And we just need to name that and acknowledge it right from the very beginning. So we're going to start with the past with this quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that says, of all forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhuman. Uh, and I, I, I don't necessarily like starting off with quotes. You know, it, it, can, it can feel a really... Uh, uh, um, uh, derivative in certain contexts, but I think that this is really the best way to start. Uh, because, you know, at the time, MLK was, was talking to contemporary issues around uh, health and race, but he was also giving voice to some of the medical abuses against the Black community, uh, both past and present. Uh, so we know that the Black community is, is woefully underserved, uh, and this is partially rooted in a lots of uh, the debilitating effects of early medicine from the 7th to 19th centuries here in the United States. Um, so where you, you had really rich, healthy, privileged uh, white folks, they were able to withstand some of these uh, primitive aspects of medicine, like bloodletting or skull drilling. Um, you know, unfortunately, because of their uh, position as enslaved Africans, a lot of those folks uh, died or were uh, irreparably harmed. And so it actually was mistook for racial differences then. And that was the birth uh, of, of this concept of what we call uh, racial disparities or inequities. And in fact, uh, American founding father, uh, Thomas Jefferson said, never bleed a Negro. Uh, and he's directly quoted for saying that. So, so even then, the, the side with the privilege couldn't understand the side of, of disadvantage. And they couldn't understand the side of suffering. And so they assumed um, instead of anything that they're doing, that it was an essential inherent deficiency. And I really want you to remember that because that's the heart of today's presentation. The side of privilege not only won't, uh, but sometimes they simply can't understand uh, the, the side of disadvantage. And so they will invent reasons. They'll cite God or science or medicine or Medicare reimbursement rates to justify why the world is the way that it is. And so this happened then, but crucially, it's still happening now. So but before we kind of jump into the now, I want to talk about the elephant in the room, which is, uh, of course, uh, talking about uh, the Tuskegee syphilis study, which was conducted by the U.S. Public Health Service from 1932 to 1972. Uh, and so even then, even during this time, uh, uh, the, you know, the individuals who were involved in this study, uh, they weren't told that they were being treated for, they were, they were being studied on the basis of their syphilis or uh, that they even had syphilis. They were just told that they had bad blood, um, but they were enticed with something that was called free burials. Um, and they were enticed with free healthcare. Um, but in reality, these things, these incentives were really just ties to keep them involved in the study and to keep other uh, 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 practicing physicians and clinicians uh, with any access uh, to this research population. So the story broke in 1965 um, as, as part of, you know, in the civil rights movement, but nobody really cared until the New York Times uh, published it uh, in 1972. So 
um, you know, once the New York Times publishes something, it becomes real and uh, it becomes uh, something that is actionable. So within just a few weeks of this date of July 26, 1972, uh, the study was, was shut down. And what we're taught in graduate medical school was that this was the end of, uh, of kind of unethical research in the United States. Uh, but it turns out that it's not quite that simple. Uh, so I'm actually going to, to skip this slide in favor of jumping to uh, kind of a quick summary of other, other medical abuses against Blacks. And you can see here that some of those dates lead right up to uh, 1972, but uh, the last two bullet points, uh, as you can see here, uh, go well beyond it. So we know that uh, there is a long and awful history of medical abuses against Blacks um, that is uh, somewhat well documented, but uh, could be documented, I think, better. Um, however, what I think is less well understood is why we need to talk about medical abuses when this talk is supposed to be about inequities and disparities. Is there really a connection between the two? Uh, so at this point, I'm going to show you a brief clip from a, uh, a video put together by Vox and ProPublica uh, a few years ago, back in 2017, uh, that kind of connects this culture of abuse to uh, the, the reality of modern day disparities. In a lot of ways, Sims epitomizes the story of American medicine for black women. It's a system that's failing them to this day. From infant mortality to life expectancy, the racial disparities in healthcare are staggering. The gulf between black and white might be widest when we look at maternal mortality, with black women three to four times more likely to die in connection with pregnancy or birth than white women. And that divide can be traced back to doctors like Sims who contributed to a long, largely overlooked history of institutional racism in medicine. Trying to understand a historical problem without knowing its history is like trying to treat a patient without eliciting a thorough medical history you're doomed to failure. All right, and um, before we move on, I just wanted to give a, a brief plug uh, to this woman. This is Harriet Washington, who has written uh, a number of exceptional books about uh, kind of the history of uh, medicalized abuse. Uh, so Medical Apartheid, which was published uh, about 12 or 13 years ago, is really a must read. It's not easy, but it, it kind of documents some of these uh, abuses that uh, that really haven't seen much of the light of day. So you, you think it's just Tuskegee and Henrietta Lacks, um, but unfortunately it's much more. And then her, her more recent book called Carte Blanche, which actually came out this year, um, talks about the erosion of medical and medicalized consent. Uh, so I just need you to know that there is a rich, rich history that governs the way that we conduct research to this day. And um, in order to, to address it, we have to know it first. So here's a plug for, for Harriet Washington's books. Uh, so now let's talk about this, this problematic term of disparities, um, because, you know, there are lots of lots of theoretical concerns uh, that, that, that emerge when you start to apply the concept of disparities to basic medical and, and clinical research. So what do we mean by that? Um, I, I want to break down a little bit by the way that I'm going to be using this term in today's uh, presentation. So historically, all differences between groups were, were kind of lumped into this term with the underlying assumption that they were somehow immutable or, or inherent. And nowadays, uh, I, I think we've, we've done a little bit better. We understand that while there may be some biological differences between groups, social inequities drive some of the differences we observe. But I think it's important to recognize that even this parsing leaves a whole lot to be desired and often puts the blame and the onus on vulnerable, underserved, and marginalized groups. So what I'm proposing in this talk is that we, what we actually think of as disparities or the combination of social inequities and biological disparities looks a little bit more like this, which reconnects the work that we need to do with domains where we, where we as researchers really have the ability and the responsibility to assess, model, and limit. So let's talk about uh, something that should be familiar to most of us in, in the audience. Uh, let's talk about dementia risk as a function of these disparities. So historically, what we thought of as, as say, racial differences to dementia as inherent, uh, you know, the idea that white people have some risk, black people inherently have more risk. Uh, but in reality, the difference is probably, almost certainly, much more complex. So maybe there is uh, that, uh, that inherent difference. But before we can come to that conclusion, before we can responsibly uh, uh, talk about it in this way, 
Um, we need to think about uh, elements of selection bias, those who we bring into our studies uh, in, of dementia in the first place, which in recent history tends to favor much more privileged populations. And, and assuming we get past this first barrier of selection bias, uh, there may be differences in measurement error or measurement bias in terms of the validity of dementia rating scales as they interact with, with cultures and uh, presentations that are not well represented uh, in research due to selection bias. And then of course, and, and as is I think well understood by translational researchers and clinicians, um, you know, there are implementation biases in terms of how patients are diagnosed, treated, and cared for, and, and how we actually conduct multi-center research studies uh, from place to place. Uh, beyond that, of course, we get into what, uh, what should be a little bit more familiar to us, these idea of social inequities that lead some groups uh, to, to have better or worse access to care and subsequently outcomes, uh, and as well as environmental factors which may affect presentation and progress of dementia. So if and only if is what I'm gonna argue here, you can appropriately apportion variance to these earlier four factors, if there is still essentialized variance left over in your models, you can reasonably conclude that there is indeed that biological or essentialized difference as a function of race. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I'm saying we need to get our science right before we come to that conclusion. So to contextualize everything that's coming up, most research on what we think of as disparities or diversity really falls into these two categories with maybe a little tiny bit of this one. The care research centers approach to, uh, to, to equity more generally in, in research focuses more on these issues. And this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. So in, in adopting a framework that looks a little bit like this, we can really much better start to understand how to measure and intervene on these biases using existing scientific tools. So, you know, while there is a strong need to, to obviously overhaul our systems to be much more equitable, we don't have to entirely reinvent the wheel to see how we're doing. Uh, so with that in mind, let's talk about bias reduction in selection, measurement, and implementation. And when I talk about recruitment, um, there's a well-characterized principle known as lasagna's law. So this has nothing to do with diversity. It just has to do with getting people into our research studies. And Lasagna's Law was characterized back in the 1960s and 70s. And it says, the incidence of patient availability sharply decreases when a clinical trial begins and returns to its original level as soon as the trial is completed. So this is a bit of a tongue in cheek quote. It's a bit of a humorous quote that basically says that people who design trials have no idea who's going to be signing up for them. We, we wildly overestimate when we're writing our grants, when we're getting our, our, um, our research colleagues excited about a study. And then when the trial actually needs to open, when the study starts to enroll, we really temper uh, those, those claims down. So um, Munch's third law, which is a close corollary of Lasagna's law, says that we take whatever we estimate, uh, whatever we write in our grant, we divide it by 10, and that is a realistic number of who's going to be coming into our study. So if we think we're going to get 100 people in our grant, we actually will probably only get 10. Um, and it, it turns out that this is a mathematical principle, and it, it has been demonstrated in many, many fields of clinical research. So with that in mind, we, if we know that research is, is difficult to recruit for, why should we care about diversity? Like, I mean, I know it's, it's sort of like the done thing, and we're all kind of pretending to care after 2020, but is there, is there, are there real principles about why diversity is clinical, uh, crucial for clinical research? And it turns out, you know, surprised that there are. Um, so it's not just a matter of, of thinking about diversity because it is sort of the, the, the morally fashionable thing to do. Uh, it turns out that there are really good scientific reasons to care about this. So we know that uh, from work that was done actually by FDA researchers, Remember Morthy and colleagues, uh, found that 20% of FDA approval. So these are trials that got past phase one, phase two, and phase three, and were approved by the FDA. 20% of those had some sort of differential response in terms of exposure, efficacy, or um, uh, 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 just overall response in terms of uh, racial or ethnic groups. So we know that we're not catching these things in the early phases of clinical research. And we also know that even in our home base of thinking about dementia and Alzheimer's disease, the representation issues by having a lack of diversity it really threatens not just the external validity, which is what many of us uh, as researchers think about, but it affects the internal validity as well. It means, in other words, that we may not know what dementia is because we haven't done our study 
on our studies on populations at high risk. And there are a number of really great um, uh, citations here. I, I highly encourage you to read all of them. Uh, but the Manley and Gleamore paper was published. Uh, is just it's, it was published in Gemma Neurology just a couple of weeks ago, and uh, really talks about uh, you know this representation issue in the context of the the newly approved Adjuhelm. Um, and I just highly encourage you to read it. I think it's uh, available open access for a little bit longer. So it's not just a matter of uh, threats to, to external and internal validity. It's not just a matter of recognizing that there is this racial bias in the way that we are inherently conducting research, but the selection and survival biases that are inherent in our research, they will skew our estimates of any kind of causal factors. So what I'm trying to say here is that if you're trying to run a research study that's looking at cause to effect, unfortunately, if you have a, um, uh, an overprivileged sample, a sample that is uh, much wider than the population that you're trying to generalize to, it means that you may not understand uh, whether the thing that you're studying has an effect on the thing that you hope it does. So if you're trying to treat dementia, but you don't have a representative sample, you, you may not be able to trust this, the, the kind of the statistics that you get. And so here is a perfect example of what I mean by that. It's not just a theoretical principle. It's not just something that props up in, in simulation data. Uh, but Carrie Gleason and colleagues up at the University of Wisconsin published this about two years ago. And I think as soon as it was published, I started putting it in all of my talks um, because it's, it's so crucial. So this is looking at one of our largest data sets in the field of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. This is called uh, the NAC data set, which is short for the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center. And so this is looking at about 3,400 white people and about 600 black people that have something called mild cognitive impairment. At baseline. You can think of that as kind of like a pre-dementia or a pre-Alzheimer's disease. Um, so what we see here, for those of you who, who may not know how to read a, a Kaplan-Meier curve, is that when you see the line kind of declining very steeply, as you see here with the white people, um, what that means is that these individuals are progressing all the way to that full-blown dementia at a much faster rate than the Black people uh, that you see over here over time. Um, and so what, what I think is important to, to keep in mind here is that everything that we've ever studied, everything that we understand about dementia and Alzheimer's disease tells us that Black people should be declining, uh, they should be progressing much faster than white people. And so what you see here, again, from one of our largest data sets is the opposite. So if you, in case you're struggling to understand what all this means, I'm interested, um, you're going to have like a little gif of, of Stacey Abrams here that tells you how you should be reacting uh, to this data. There is nothing about this that makes sense. You know, if, if we have this large data set between white people and black people, and it's telling us that the white people get dementia more than the black people, but every other research study that we have tells us the, exactly the opposite, what's going on here? You know, is it possible that the, that the people who published the study like made a really embarrassing error? Like maybe the white people are the black people and the black people are the white people? No, that's not what happened. What happened is that uh, we didn't understand how to recruit. Uh, we didn't understand how to recruit um, different populations. And so what's interesting is that this, these data didn't come from one place. It came from all over. So a bunch of different universities, a bunch of different ac academic medical centers all contributed a little bit of data all over the country that adds up to this effect. And so what we have here, and this is a, a bit of a complicated graphic, so I'm going to go back and explain it more simply, is something called a healthy worker bias. It means that if you get all of your white people from one place and all of your black people from another place, you may not be able to compare the groups the way that you think you can. And so taking this back, all of the white people presented here came from a memory clinic. And if you think about who's going to show up to a memory clinic, it's people with memory problems. All of the black people, on the other hand, came from community settings. We went into the black churches, we did community events, and that's where these individuals came from. They didn't come from a memory clinic. So of course, they're not going to have memory complaints at the same rate as people who came into the memory clinic. So in other words, what you have here is not a, com a comparison of white people versus black people. You've got memory clinic patients versus people who are coming into a study from a community setting. So what we have here is uh, you know, kind of a danger where you are looking for diversity, but you're not being careful or thoughtful about your selection bias. So what that means is that the, when it comes to the state of representation science, there's a lot of manuscripts, a lot of publications out there 
but there's no clear definitions. There's no, there's not a clear data framework or ontology. A lot of the articles that you see will focus on like single site case studies. Um, the metrics that they care about are only focused on enrollment. So those who signed up for a study, we don't really care about everyone else. Um, and so what that means is it's really hard to operationalize or generalize uh, the data that, that's already out there. There's lots of confounds. We don't even really quite know what a minority is. Um, and then it kind of leads to this question that I have, which is, is most of diverse recruitment, is that just the byproduct of somebody who is charismatic, somebody who's well-connected in the community, and somebody who is woefully underpaid as a CRC, as a, as a community research coordinator, or sorry, a clinical research coordinator? Uh, and then so ultimately, the biggest problem is that we don't have much of an infrastructure to fix this problem. There aren't many experts or tools or resources uh, that people can use to, to try to get diverse, inclusive research participants. Um, the study staff that we have is already overworked. They don't have the ability to think about in recruitment. And then when they do think about community outreach and engagement, it's always entirely separate from the actual research protocols that we're doing. And you can read a little bit more about this uh, in a paper that I published uh, with, with Kushnu Indoriwala um, back earlier this year in, the, in uh, the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease. So if you think about the fact that we have this really big problem when it comes to recruitment, you might feel a little bit like Chrissy Teigen, uh, where you can just say, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna give up. I'm gonna hope that somebody else solves this and that I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, but it turns out that uh, work that we've done at the Care Research Center has kind of helped fix this a little bit. So instead of thinking about the 10 different reasons why we can't recruit diversely and sort of saying, well, I've only got limited resources, I'm gonna care about, I don't know, number six and number three and see if that gets me where I need to go. Um, we have instead tried to take these same 10, top 10 reasons of, of why it's difficult to recruit or why it's difficult to, re to recruit diversely. And we've built them into an ordered workflow. So some of these map right onto to kind of very specific areas. Uh, and some of these like screening uh, map onto multiple barriers and ones that we are much more familiar with. Um, but ultimately what you can do is you can take this top 10 list and create uh, what I call kind of a, a, a recruitment workflow um, or uh, an inverted pyramid that, that tells you um, how you need to think more carefully about where your research participants come from. So this is a reimagining of the research workflow where everything you see in the red box is the stuff that we currently care about. And the stuff that we often miss are these decisional states uh, for our research participants, because each of these is some aspect of selection that uh, combines and multiplies um, uh, in such a way that it may make our, our research uh, participants that get to this phase highly selected. So um, I've got a few examples of for what I mean in terms of that, but we're running a little bit low on time. So I'm gonna kind of uh, uh, cherry pick a little bit. So when it comes to thinking about um, uh, this work in the context of pragmatic trials. So many of you who are involved in research will do uh, observational studies or you'll do kind of a classic um, RCT design, uh, but pragmatic trials are really designed to, to kind of uh, um, be that final step of, um, of, of intervention efficacy because it does really focus on implementing an intervention uh, in a way that people will actually use it, like in their homes. So um, oftentimes when you're designing a pragmatic trial, you'll use something called the Prestes II framework. Uh, so there are nine domains which are mapped here in terms of how pragmatic your trial is. And if you have a very pragmatic trial, it's this really strong real world evidence. Uh, one of the key differences is that um, most pragmatic trials will randomize entire healthcare systems rather than um, specific individuals to, to trials. But um, there's still a need to strongly think about equity. Uh, and stuff that I, I'm working on uh, as part of the NIA Impact Collaboratory is, is thinking about um, modifying this framework for pragmatic trial assessment uh, to really promote equity and representation. So potentially adding a 10th domain, that of value, uh, but also thinking about uh, making sure that you're thinking about these nine elements within the Prestes II at different levels. So thinking about it as the individual or the research participant level, thinking about these nine elements at the level of teams and institutions, and then thinking about this uh, in terms of larger systems and structural norms. And so when you think about this, this, these nine domains across each of these stakeholder groups, it becomes much easier to think about designing research studies uh, with equity. And so what that means ultimately is instead of thinking about traditional outcomes, you can start to derive equity outcomes across many aspects of these very, very complicated 
uh, uh, research um, uh, designs. Um, another thing that I want to talk about very quickly about is the concept of race and dementia. And I'll probably end up uh, kind of concluding my comments uh, after talking about this. So we know and we've heard from many, many studies that African Americans are two to four times more likely than whites to develop dementia. Uh, Latinx individuals are about one and a half times as likely. A lot of this is commonly attributed to comorbid uh, factors in, in vasculature. So stroke risk or diabetes risk, things like that. Um, however, we need to be thoughtful about the way that we're using race in research. So usually we use it for one of three reasons, as a construct, so to kind of make our analysis simple. Um, we use it as a variable in our studies. Um, so we say, you know, race is our proxy variable for genetic variation or for some aspect of genetic ancestry, or sometimes we use race uh, as a marker for racism. So uh, we'll say that, that uh, you know, if you are a particular race, that that means that you have been marked for some kind of selection effect uh, for, for access to healthcare. But none of these are good reasons to ever use race in our research studies. There is no justifiable bias for ever using it for anything as, as, as one marker of enrollment, honestly. So it's actually the way that we use race right now is a conflation of all five of these proposed levels of bias, which tells us absolutely nothing scientifically. So if we're gonna be talking about it, uh, and this will be my last slide or second to last slide. Um, if we try to think about using it for these three reasons, if we try to use race as a construct, uh, we're really committing that, that violation of, of a measurement error uh, because it is not a great proxy for socioeconomic factors. Um, and you know, it tends to really limit uh, uh, kind of the validity of our studies. If we wanna use it as a variable, we know that it's also not a good marker of genetic variation and ancestry. There's more variability within races than there is across races. We hear this time and again. Uh, race is often tied to the US Census. And if you've ever looked at the way that race is documented in the US Census, it changes a definition every decade. So if you're running a study in 2008 um, and, and basing that on the 2000 Census, you can't run the same study in 2021 based on the 2020 Census because they're entirely different ways of documenting uh, uh, racial variation within the same country. Um, and then finally, when we think about race as an indicator of racism, uh, it tends to be a conflation of selection bias and measurement error, because it, it sort of unfortunately shifts us from thinking about the barriers to thinking about individuals who have been victimized by this. And it really creates misleading monoliths for both racial minorities and majorities. So the advice of you got to go into black churches to reach black people, that really works for black people who go to church. Um, you know, for, for a lot of other folks who identify as black but don't uh, connect socially that way, you're, you're not going to reach these, this, these groups at all. So, you know, ultimately the bottom line is to treat people as people in both your clinical research and care. And uh, you really need to think about a kind of a fundamental intersection of the way that you implement your studies uh, with, with different kinds of biases of, of implementation. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm out of time and I want to get to some audience discussion, but I wanted to kind of conclude with like some of the, I think, uh, the kind of the most thoughtful um, wisdom that I have received on this topic. So, you know, we've talked about these very complex aspects of, of race and bias and equity, but um, ultimately the, the, the best way to think about all these things is to follow the words of, um, uh, I think somebody that we could all regard as, as a hero. And that person is MC Hammer, who wrote this on Twitter in February. When you measure, include the measurer. Uh, and I will conclude my talk uh, on this comment and, uh, and open it up for a little bit of uh, questions. So thank you so much for your time. I'm sorry for going a little bit over, but I'm hoping that uh, I can address anything that was unclear in the Q&A section. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. No, you're you're just you're just right in terms of time. Apologies if you felt rushed in any way. Uh, so as a reminder, folks, you are welcome to submit questions. The best place to put them is in the Q and A. I will sort of get things started while people are uh, typing. Yeah. So, you know, really fantastic presentation. Um, on a selfish note, it really um, enjoyed and related to the examples that you drew from the Alzheimer's research world. And, you know, sort of on that note, um, so this this fundamental problem, which I think we, we do suffer from in, in Pittsburgh as well, um, that the majority of um, 
participants of uh, white participants are um, sort of self-referred, uh, you know, very seeking uh, a clinical research evaluation. And um, most of our African-American participants are um, recruited from the community and, you know, invited to participate. Um, try to be, be careful in my phrasing here, but would you, so if the individuals that are um, comprising the clinic-based sample, would you not say that it really, there are some factors related to systemic racism that have brought a disproportionately Caucasian, non-Hispanic white sample to the clinic? Um, and how do we, um, in practical terms, try to overcome um, those issues? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. And I think that's that is uh, kind of the the conversation that I often have with people, which is we, we've got this problem. What do we do about it? Like, I know that we need to do something, but what is the thing that we do? I don't want to do a, like a, an even more wrong thing here. Uh, so when, when I when I give research consultations, which I do for free, so if anybody ever needs help with their research and, and kind of recruitment, uh, look me up. I'm happy to help. Um, I, I often tell researchers that there are two options. You can either change a thing or you can explain why a thing can't be changed. Um, and so obviously, you know, the best of all worlds is to do both, um, you know, where, wherever you can. Um, but in this case, uh, I, I think that the, the advice is sort of twofold. So number one, we really need to stop relying on race as, as any kind of marker of, of anything, frankly, in our studies, other than somebody's racial identity. Um, usually be, because we're trying to use race to, as a proxy for something else, we should just go figure out what that something else is and measure that instead. So let's model some of these aspects of privilege um, that kind of differentiate a clinic sample versus a community sample. Because it turns out if you look at these two groups, they differ on a whole bunch of uh, other demographic factors beyond race. Uh, the people that come into our clinic are, are also disproportionately likely um, you know, for, for, for most research, they, they are disproportionately likely to be male. Uh, for us, uh, in dementia research, they are disproportionately likely to be female. Um, they are disproportionately likely to be wealthy. They are disproportionately likely to have a master's or a doctoral degree. They are disproportionately likely to live in a suburb along the east or west coast of the United States of America. So if you are not all of those things at once, you are likely to be underrepresented in clinical and in kind of your basic, your in clinical research studies more generally, but also our clinic-based samples that we uh, that we often pull from from our research. And so, if you can't change that, and let's just say that the way that your academic healthcare system is set up, you know, with insurance and reimbursement, you just can't get there. Um, I understand, but you need to explain that to your local community. Uh, you need to advocate for change. But most importantly, as a scientist, you need to be modeling those sources of variance, because I guarantee you, you know, if you learn basic statistics, anything that, that you kind of miss in terms of modeling tends to be uh, kind of variance that rolls into your error term. And if you think about this from a biostatistical point of view, and the larger your error term, the harder it is to see the stuff that you're looking for. So by modeling that, you're not just making, you know, giving yourself a chance to be more equitable. You're giving yourself a chance to see the stuff that you're looking for in the first place. So, you know, it's not just one of those things where it, it's, again, like the noble thing to do. This is the way to make it easier to see the stuff that you're actually excited about. Excellent. Okay, we've got um, lots of words of praise uh, for your talk coming in through Thank the you. chat. Yeah, um, and I see an excellent question from one of our PhD students. Coco Dong mm -hmm. is asking if you could elaborate on the concept of return of value. Oh, yes, yes. I had to go really, really fast in that. But um, so the return of value is a term that has that was popularized uh, by Consuelo Wilkins at uh, Vanderbilt and Meharry. And if you don't know the work of Consuelo Wilkins, uh, and you do you do anything related to equity and research, you need to like stop listening to me, uh, like exit out of this talk and go and look up her work and follow her on Twitter um, because she has much more profound thoughts than I ever will. Um, but in 2019, she published like this really, really great paper about the concept of return of value. So the, 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 just to give a little bit of background, when it comes to return of results, many of us are still in research fields that are debating about whether we should provide like information, individualized information back to people. But if you look in the field of bioethics, especially bioethics of research, 
it's been a settled matter for like a decade. They, they have actually offered multiple consensus statements that we need to be offering individualized return of results um, uh, from our research studies, even observational research studies. Um, so when we think of return of value, it's bigger than just return of results. It's bigger than uh, just providing remuneration or reimbursement for like parking. Um, it's, it's bigger than uh, the kind of this concept of altruism that really powers a lot of the, the, the reason why people sign up for our research studies. Return of value means you're getting something out of this research experience that is of material importance to you. Uh, and so the way that I think about it, just for ease of interpretation, is that it's one of three things. It is time, it is information, or it is money. So these are three commodities uh, that we can offer our research participants when they come in and, and uh, are involved in our research studies. And the studies that have good retention offer all three. They give you time uh, in terms of making sure that you have uh, kind of one-on-one -on -one time with an expert uh, to learn more about whatever it is that you, that's being studied. Uh, they give you information often in the terms of individualized return of, of, of information or results. Um, and then of course they, they give you money. It doesn't need to be an excessive amount of money, uh, but if you're not giving much in the way of money, like uh, if you're paying somebody $25 for 10 years of access to their DNA, uh, for example, which is a real thing that some studies do, um, then you need to be offering a lot more of that, of that time and information. So uh, when, I, when I talk about return of value, it's the idea that there are multiple reasons um, that are important to an individual to be involved in a research study. The more of those that you can supply and, and the more diverse you can make them, the easier it will be to recruit and retain people long-term to your research. And it, it doesn't have to be expensive. Um, you know, if you don't have a lot of money, you just need more time. Excellent, thank you. Very important concept there. Okay, we've got a question coming, Coco, thanks you. We've got a question coming in from Dr. Rosso, uh, thanking you for an excellent talk, asking if you can speak to differential measurement error with respect to the MCI dementia diagnosis, particularly in the context of historic and current over-reliance on well-educated white samples. So speaking to the differential measurement error. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, so this is going to get a little into the weeds. Uh, so apologies for for anybody who is not as uh, interested in statistics. But uh, basically, we don't have data at, the, at quite the quality I would like to really make this kind of a slam dunk concept. But it is hypothesized, and we do have some kind of emergent data uh, from uh, from kind of long term cohorts. Uh, based in Chicago, uh, based in California, and based in New York, uh, that, that seem to show that the, the way that we diagnose somebody with mild cognitive impairment, uh, or the way that we, we tend to rely on something like the, the CDR, the clinical dementia radius, rating scale, or even our quick and dirty measures, uh, like, the, like the mini mental, um, a lot of these were tested and validated on uh, populations that are, are uniquely privileged, which means that they have really strong predictive value in those groups, um, but they have somewhat lesser predictive value in other groups. So a great example, um, I, I published a, a paper four years ago now uh, in, in the journal Age and Aging, looking at uh, preclinical Alzheimer's disease and some common measures of, uh, of subjective memory, um, so kind of subjective cognitive concerns, uh, as well as objective measures. And so this was like very standard stuff that you would see in any cognitive battery. And what you found is that um, these measures uh, correlated very well uh, with one another. So, you know, as, as kind of uh, as like larger constructs, as well as individualized, they correlated very, very well in the white sample that we had, the white highly privileged sample that we had in the Harvard Aging Brain Study. Um, when you looked at the individual measures in the black sample, they correlated not at all, like not at all. There was no predictive utility at all for the black sample. And so it, again, this is not an issue of white versus black. This is an issue of privilege versus less privilege. So most of the white people came uh, to the Harvard Aging Brain Study from clinics. Most of the black people came from community uh, uh, community samples. And so what we have is the, kind of this emergent problem that as we start to get larger and larger research studies uh, within the field of Alzheimer's and dementia, and as we start to get more and more diverse samples, we are going to have to go back and reevaluate uh, the utility and the predictive value of these measures um, that have been uh, honed on a very white, very privileged sample. Um, so I think that day of reckoning is probably coming sooner rather than later. 
Um, so honestly, you're going to want to be on the right side of the history with this one. So try to get ahead of it while you can. Um, so again, if you can't change it, like maybe you don't have the, you know, the, the ability to kind of revalidate um, uh, like the mini mental with a diverse sample, just make sure that you're modeling on the basis of, of some of these aspects of privilege and introduce that into your models um, to, to try to offset uh, as much of that as you can. Okay, so speaking of modeling, uh, the Pittsburgh audience is really interested in, um, you know, in your recommendations on how we can really take more methodologically rigorous approaches to try to, um, I think, account for um, some of these issues. So following in that theme, we have a question from Dr. Shaban. She is asking, how do you conceive of modeling intersectionality? when there are interlocking systems of oppression based on multiple identities. So her example is a black man with a physical disability, um, an Asian American woman. Um, so when you have, um, yeah, multiple interlocking systems of oppression, um, you know, how, can, can statistics save us here, Dr. Jackson? You seem to be muted. All right, I apologize, my computer froze. <laughs> I've got a backup laptop here just in case things go south. Um, but um, I, I might be a little overly optimistic, but I do think statistics can save us here. Um, and it just turns out that if we can use uh, more flexible modeling techniques, uh, it becomes possible um, and even encouraged to think about modeling aspects of intersectionality. So there, there, there is a word of caution. We need to be careful about what we're modeling here. So again, I feel very strongly that race should not be something that we're modeling. We should instead be looking for those elements of uh, it's socioeconomic or demographic privilege, um, and then inter and like modeling those intersectionally as well. But if you think about um, kind of your basic structure for like a hierarchical linear model, we can start to nest some of these variables uh, within like a very, very basic uh, linear mixed model design. So, you know, intersectionality is tough to do if you're running like a t-test or a basic uh, ANOVA or even like a regular old run-of-the-mill like linear regression. Um, but as you start to move into to much more flexible methods like hierarchical linear modeling, uh, it does give you the ability to start to think about these things uh, more intersectionally as you kind of nest some of these, uh, these models together. Now, I think that we'll probably have to move beyond hierarchical linear modeling into canonical analysis before we can really get, uh, get this going in a way that I think is truly effective. And uh, maybe that will be my quest or the quest of the next generation of researchers after me. Um, but I, I think that the, we do have this kind of the statistical tools to address this. And now on the other side of things, if you're thinking about um, like clinical research studies, um, there are these uh, beautiful, elegant, emergent ways of conducting research, uh, interventional research outside of the classic RCT design that do allow for flexibility of individuals and flexibility of identities to participate. So thinking about, um, uh, uh, you know, like really, really emergent and, and very interesting models um, so, so like I mentioned, talking about pragmatic trials, for example, uh, where there is kind of this inherent nesting, um, and then also thinking about um, a, kind of a new, a very newly described method called the cohort multiple um, uh, RCT design, which uh, is, is similar to the pragmatic trial in a lot of ways, but allows you to kind of identify subsets of individuals and then randomize them um, in a, in a way that, uh, without getting into all the details, randomize them in a way that allows you to start to look at some of these elements uh, kind of intersectionally, but also design it for local and community benefits. So uh, one last note, going back to Consuela Wilkins, one of the things that her team has really popularized is something called the Community Engagement Studio Model, the CE Studio Model, where uh, instead of researchers kind of designing research um, and trying to fit people into buckets into our models, the, you know, we, we kind of engage community experts as co-designers, as co-eyes and co-PIs on our studies uh, and looks for, for kind of uh, ways of assessing um, um, outcomes, privileged identities, uh, demographics, uh, according to what, what is valued locally or, or in a national sample, for example. So 
The, the short term answer is yes, statistics will save us. The long term answer is what well, we need to bring in other kinds of expertise uh, to avoid this problem in the first place. Excellent answer. I mean, so comprehensive. So I hear you suggesting this multi pronged approach, beginning with conceptualization and design and all the way through to the analytic approach um, to, to try to chip away at, at this, these complexities. So I think the um, last question, because we do have some closing remarks planned for this afternoon. Um, so I, th I think I'll circle back to a question from Dr. Jason Flat and invite you, Dr. Jackson, to give um, some, some final remarks. This is somewhat of a broad question. He's asking for your thoughts on how to engage rush, um, individuals um, who identify as coming from racial and ethnic minority groups who are living with dementia, uh, how we engage these folks in research and um, what recommendations you have for um, engaging uh, these individuals? Ooh, yeah, um, so uh, where to begin? Um, I think that the one thing that I'll say is, is to kind of reiterate a point that I made earlier, which is we need to treat people as people. Um, and it's one of the one of the really great parts of one of the projects that I do in working on the NIA Impact Collaboratory, which looks at advancing kind of a pragmatic trial designs, is they they have um, a stakeholder engagement team. So this is an entire core within the collaboratory um, that's really focused on identifying uh, people with lived experience of dementia and incorporating them not just into the collaboratory um, but also into other pragmatic trials that come out of uh, uh, this group as well. So, uh, you know, the first thing that I, I, I want to say is that if you are, you know, is, is that that old adage, nothing about us without us. So, you know, while I can speak to kind of the, the experience of being a, a racially minoritized individual, I can't speak to the experience of, of somebody who has, you know, direct experience of, of living with dementia. These folks need to be part of your of your research studies. They need to be part of your care models. They need to be part of your of your patient and faculty advisory councils, uh, your patient or family advisory councils rather. So um, the first thing you got to do is, is kind of incorporate them into um, into your your workflow. Um, the second thing is that if you look at um, you know the, the, the dementia uh, UK has like really great um, uh, policy on their website about planning a dementia friendly meeting. And uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, advice. I think I've got the slide here. I, I won't necessarily share it with you, but uh, you know, some of the aspects of planning a dementia-friendly meeting include uh, making sure that there are um, uh, that there are toilets nearby uh, if you're having an in-person meeting. Making sure that there's good sign like wayfinding so that people can find where the room is. Uh, make sure that people aren't crowded too closely together so they can have a conversation without overhearing the people next to them. And it turns out that uh, if you follow all of the advice, it's not a dementia friendly meeting, it's just a good meeting. And so by designing for individuals um, who have less privilege than us, whether that's because of their cognitive status, their race or their gender identity, it turns out you make things easier for everyone else. So again, you know, th there's no magic here. It, you know, there's just a bunch of little things that we gotta get better at. When you treat people as people, um, you know, whether we're talking about race or dementia, um, you know, it, it becomes much easier to do high quality work uh, and it becomes much uh, uh, more, like the, the, the impact of our work becomes much more thoughtful and ethical. So, you know, if I had to give any advice, just treat people like they're people. Uh, you know, you know we, we need to stop looking for those differences and um, really focus on uh, what kind of, uh, what common outcomes we can all look for together. Sage advice. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Much, much appreciated. So before thing, before I um, turn things over and relinquish the mic for some closing remarks, I would like to once again thank my fellow planning committee members. I would like to thank our uh, phenomenal speakers, Dr. Jackson, also Dr. Stephen Thomas for joining us for his inspirational and um, challenging keynote address this morning, as well as our session one presenters, Drs. Ashley Hill, Patricia Dacume, and Uchenna Mbawuke. Um, it has been a very meaningful day, and hopefully it is the start to an action-oriented um, response to promoting equity in re clinical research at the University of Pittsburgh. Also behind the scenes, a couple of folks that haven't received mention today, Dr. Annie Cohen, who um, uh, is generously responsible for um, 
uh, ensuring NIH support for these uh, for the workshop, as well as I don't think Melissa Knox has gotten a shout out today. I know she has been behind the scenes on the technical side, helping things to go smoothly. And um, just before I relinquish, if everyone could please um, give uh, express uh, gratitude to Melita Terry for her fantastic coordination efforts today and making this all come together and keeping us all in line. Thank you, Melita. It is now my distinct honor to pass the mic over to Ms. Paula Davis. Ms. Davis is the Associate Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the University of Pittsburgh Schools of the Health Sciences. Ms. Davis's career has centered on higher education administration, including diversity, equity, and inclusion, recruitment and admissions, financial aid, academic advising, alumni relations, and support services for diverse student populations. A certified diversity executive, Ms. Davis is a two-time graduate of the University of Pittsburgh, the first individual recipient of the Chancellor's Affirmative Action Award. Davis chairs the board of M Powerhouse, a nonprofit founded to support students of color in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. The parent of a young adult on the autistic spectrum, Ms. Davis is a staunch advocate for disability research and education. Associate Vice Chancellor Davis, welcome. Please take the mic. Thank you very much, Dr. Lingler. I appreciate it. This has been absolutely amazing. I'd like to thank everyone for attending Racism and Its Implications in Clinical Research. Um, what a tremendous group of speakers. And the information shared today has just been incredibly rich. What I take away from today is the clarity that in spite of our best intentions, the ways in which we conduct clinical research and engage communities continue to be flawed. Um, often approaching the work through lenses that assume that all potential participants live similar lives or have similar challenges. And the data presented by our speakers today emphasizes the fallacy in those assumptions and emphasizes the need for an equity lens in clinical research and in health overall. I was particularly happy uh, starting the day with Dr. Stephen Thomas's talk it was a particular treat. Um, as his work while he was here at Pitt was instrumental to our broad institutional attention to health equity on campus. And I hope, Dr. Thomas, you are heartened by the, the growth of the seeds that you planted. What I carry away from your talk is how crucial it is to build trust between researchers and minoritized communities. Uh, and that being educated and other what folks might consider to be levelers do not insulate uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color from racism and its impact on poor health treatment. Um, also that the historical context of neighborhoods and of health disparities are critical, that we have to meet people where they are, both figuratively and literally, and that evidence shows that we must address both social and structural determinants in order to find solutions. Absent the examination of poverty and other systemic inequities, solutions will continue to be elusive. I was particularly heartened to hear about Maryland's bold move requiring bias training for all providers after April 2022. I think that that is, uh, it, it's, that's absolutely putting a stake in the ground. I appreciated hearing from Dr. Ashley Hill and her outstanding look at the forces impacting COVID outcomes in the Black community as well as Dr. Patricia Dockumay's look at the challenges experienced by our Latinx youth. Um, having a growing Latinx population in Pittsburgh, uh, we have to get ourselves together in order to provide the best care possible to this population. It, it's growing um, and uh, deserves every support that we could possibly uh, provide. Um, and Dr. Dockumay also closed with uh, a similar theme that providers and researchers have to embed in the community, advocate for the community, and then listen to the community. Uchenna Balike's talk on compensation inequities in research practice uh, was very similar. The voices of stakeholders are not being heard, and assumptions are made about the lives of prospective participants that prohibit them from participating in clinical research those inequities have to be resolved. 
critical feedback from community research advisory boards can improve research practice. And finally, I really thoroughly enjoyed Dr. Jackson's talk um, and the historical perspective that race-based medical abuses gave rise to healthcare disparities. Um, as arguing that what we categorize as health disparities is akin to population blaming and may arise from the impact of racial, racial bias in research methods and on care. Uh, the, the view that if recruitment pools aren't equitably selected, the comparisons will be flawed or skewed. Uh, and finally, using race as a construct um, is basically committing measurement error. It's not a proxy for socioeconomic status or many other factors that researchers might use as markers of communities versus individuals, and it lacks empirical definition. At the end of the day, we have to listen to and engage people in the community and stop making assumptions about how individuals engage with their environments and their health. We have to co-create the examination and analyses of issues and potential solutions. And recognize that researchers bring who they are to every aspect of their work from hypothesis to analysis. So in addition to just practicing good science, examination of researcher bias and positionality are critical. And I'd like to close with one of Dr. Thomas's quotes. Nobody is safe until everybody is safe and nobody is healthy until everybody is healthy. Thank you so much for being with us today for this outstanding event. Melita. Thank you, Paula. Thank you so much for giving close remarks. Um, I wanna thank everyone for attending uh, our, this workshop. Um, this idea was birthed from in wake of George Floyd and how we can do better as a um, as an academic community, as far as clinical research is concerned, to do our part in um, making the research community better with underrepresented communities. I um, am indebted to the planning committee, as Dr. Jennifer Lingler mentioned, this could not have been done without us locking arms to and being committed to making sure that we opened up the platform to begin this uh, difficult conversation um, that really requires um, all of us to um, evaluate where we are and uh, where we should go and definitely looking at the past to make sure that we are moving forward in the right direction. So to that end, I would like to say thank you to everyone. Please um, keep your eye open for um, a, an email that will ask for you to complete a short very, very short survey. It should take about two to three minutes about the content um, of this and effectiveness of this workshop. Again, thank you and have a wonderful day.